So the thing is, is what's interesting is, um, I mean, we've been having a kind of like a bigger conversation of just orthodoxy becoming indigenous in America and like what oh. is like in the West. Um, and so part of the thing is, you know, father's in London, but he's been to Athos. He's been to, he spends extensive time in Ethiopia. He's in the Antiochian archdiocese. So like the Arab um, tradition mm-hmm. of orthodoxy. I mean, he was raised in uh, Colombia. I mean, he's a, he's a man of the, you know, the 20th century. Like there's just, there's just a lot of things that maybe we could pull from, but even just talking about, like we were, we were talking about how um, he's observed, like it seems as, as if some of the kind of uh, rock aspect of pop culture has come to influence. Not that we need to go there specifically, but just give mm. you guys an example of, you know, the kind of incarnational reality of what the faith looks like. And maybe even talking about internet orthodoxy, he just came from mm. this, uh, what is it, Dixieland? Uh, Orthodox Philip Lidwell, yeah, Philip Lidwell Fellowship, yeah. But that sounds just... awesome. So... That sounds like that sounds like an awesome uh, vein to to travel down. Father so I guess Boniface... I'm sorry. I just had a quick question, Father Boniface. Um, are you familiar with the World War One artist Otto Dix? No. Okay. You you would if you if you have a computer in front of you and you and you Google Otto Dix, World War One painting. His, you'll his, you'll wreck it immediately. You'll be like, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know, I know this. I just have I have yet. I I I want to talk about this guy really badly with someone, and this isn't really necessarily the time in the recording to talk about it or at all. But I just haven't yet to talk with someone that's like, oh yeah, like yeah, I'm a huge Otto Dix fan. Yeah. So I ask everyone. But okay, well, I'm. I yes, I have seen some of his work, but there is a reason why I did not remember him. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. That's it's, fair. It's that. I mean, it's yeah. It, it, I mean, there's some technical craft. Are you not a fan? I am. I am not experiencing any sense of. The sublime. Yeah, I have the same response to his work. I have to be honest. Really? Yeah, I have the same response. Like, it's, it's, you could tell his hand, like he has a very distinct style, but there's nothing there that makes me just go, you know. So what? I mean, what? so, okay, so have you ever, have you ever seen um, Helma von um, Kapp's stuff? No. Okay, so she she is uh, she is a. How do you spell the last name? How do we spell the last name? I don't remember. It's app. So it's AP space. But if you type into a Google search bar, Helma app, I think it's Klimt. K L I M T. I think Klimt. Okay, but I might be spelling wrong because that is not in my skill set. Helma off Helma off Klimt. Helma off. Clint. Okay. She's, sorry for interrupt. Sorry for interrupting you, Father. Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I have, I have. Um, K L I N T. Yes. A F space K L I N T. Oh yes, I know her work. Okay. Yes. Uh, oh. Uh oh. Are you, <laughs> like are this, you glitching? He's glitching. So, so I saw some of her work um Mondrian side by side. So what? You were glitching for a second there. Sorry, are we, are we... continue. We're good now. Um that could... okay. So yeah, so um I'd always kind of felt like I might like her work, but there was something about it I couldn't quite put my finger on not liking about her work. Hmm. And then once I walked in the gallery space, I was like, ah, I know why I don't like her work. On one hand, it's profound. It is, it is technically well-crafted in an experimental approach to the use of color and the canvas and, and form. But the thing that I couldn't quite put my finger on when looking at her work online 
that becomes very evident when you walk into the room is that she was deeply influenced by the occult. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, looking at all of this stuff, not seeing it in person, maybe, maybe there's a glory to the piece that you see in person, um, but there seems to be certainly something psychologically disturbed mm -hmm. going on. So, mm -hmm. without getting too into it, is there something that I need to look at it within myself that that stuff draws me? Because I'm like, no, I love this. When I read, when I see Otto Dix, I'm like, to me, it, it's a it's a very good depiction of the horrors that he witnessed in that time. Yeah, is that something troubling? Is that something that's like, oh, Andrew, what's going on with this? That's a good question because I I think I I think I understand. So the, one of my favorite artists um, is. Uh, Salvador Dali, but specifically mm -hmm. his religious work. I love his Last Supper. I love his St. John of the Cross. I love his... But there is a sense standing in front of it in a gallery that it might destroy me. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. And I love Rothko. And oh. certainly towards the later end of Rothko's life he was doing things explicitly in a transcendental kind of mystical mm -hmm. approach right like his last works were supposed to be in a temple mm -hmm. um, and i'm never quite certain how close i should allow myself into the piece mm. but i think that standing on that precipice I have learned stuff about myself that I think has been fruitful. Hmm. And so maybe that's the kind of thing that depending on where you are, and obviously like the, 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 the different visual appreciation, the different techniques, right? Like um, I mean, I was struck by, by the, the iconography in, in this holy temple here that I'm in the basement of, um, it is done in a very specific style. And I'm sure that not everybody will like that style. I think it is a beautiful style, partially because it... it um... Father, how would you describe it? There's something about the imagery that I think one is influenced by... Um, well, forgive me, Father, if this is wrong, but graphic novel kind oh, of illustrated no, style. It's, it's not wrong at all. It's either. so evident. I've been wanting to say this for so long, and I'm sorry, Father Boniface. Uh, I believe it's... Maybe it's Saint, it's above the confessional. It's above the confession. And there's like a little, like it, it almost like a Klaus Johnson. It like, it's like, it's like this perfect, I don't, I want to say it's Saint Dismas, but I don't think that's Saint Dismas. Okay. Yeah. So that Saint Dismas looks so much, and forgive me, it looks like Miller and Klaus Johnson. I've always wanted to say that, but I've been in like mm. a little bit like, I don't know, but I see it so clearly every time I look at it. It's just, it looks like, if Dark Knight Returns was divine, it would be like, that's it. So anyway, sorry. I just, I'm so, thank you so much for saying that, Father Boniface. Forgive me. No, please. Um, so I think, but like, if you, if you took that and you put that into a nice, quiet English village, I think, uh, I think you'd have people upset. And maybe rightly so. Mm. But here, in this kind of a city, and the, I mean, this ties in with the question of, of what is American yes. orthodoxy. Yes. This here, I think it visually will disrupt people in the right kind of way. Mm. And I mean, in the same way that a Black Madonna is appropriate in some parts of the world and maybe a little mm -hmm. bit out of place in other parts of the world. Um. And likewise, you know, Virgin Mary's in the in styles of either Japanese or traditional mm -hmm. Chinese portrayals are beautiful. And I absolutely stand by them as long as they're done within a certain kind of iconographic and, and prayerful mm -hmm. portrayal. Mm -hmm. um, but I think good art, whether that is theologically informed art or uh, heretically informed art um, can pull on you and, and 
do things to the psyche, the soul, whatever you want to call it. Um, and obviously the art that is good for one person may not be good for another person. Mm. And so, I think yeah. that's one of the problems with the discussion, especially as I, as I've kind of been, as I watch it in certain circles is that there's, um, there's a heavy leaning in a kind of absolute, which is presented as it's something is objectively good or bad. And there is a measure of something, but that objectivism very quickly moves into like a very kind of obtuse, like absoluteness, if that mm. makes sense. Mm. That you know, there's a depersonalization that begins to happen when we make in, when we make that movement, right? Because the reality is, is that there is a, there has to be place for the person. There has to be, there has to be place for the for person for that. Like, if I could say that hypostatic aspect in regards of people, like a, a nation, a culture. Um, into you know persons individuals in which the the ground and the foundation the essence right is it has to be there for it to communicate the truth it, it was speaking in a in the context of icon of iconography let's say right are you saying a cultural context father are you saying what, there what I'm, what I'm saying is there's a foundation that can't be moved there's a ground of being that mm. is expressed in the icon that that thread has to run through something for it to be iconographic. And it, it isn't just the, the rudiments of the name, the image halo. Like it goes, it goes beyond that. There, there's oh, that's a, I, I'm, forgive me, father. That's what you're saying is the objective part that there is right, some that, objective floor, yes, foundation, floor. thread, whatever. Yeah. Yes. But what happens is this conversation gets pulled into um, I think people that have a little bit too much of a leaning on like the political side of things or, or they, they divorce the reality of the person, the personal aspect of it. So in other words, um, you know, the Serbian tradition of, of, of iconography in some respects is going to vary from, you know, things that come out of a Muscovite context that's going to be variants from something that's coming out of a Ukrainian context, right? Like there's something there and that's there to appeal to the, the, the genius of the people, the spirit of the people, whatever that is. Right. And when we be, when we start moving into trying to have a very um, rigid app, you know, like I said, it's almost like an obtuse absolutism where it's just like, no, it's this, this, and this. That is not, that's not an orthodox. Well, ethos. it's not art. It's, well, it, see, this is the thing about when we talk about art and even getting into like iconography in particular, it's like, I, I, I think, because what Father was saying is absolutely necessary. And I think some people aren't able to, wouldn't be able to hear that because they're too caught up in seeing the icon as a means of culture war and boundary versus experience and communion right and so so in other words let me say like this why there's so many different saints because there's so many different people right right and that like father and i were talking about this i think earlier yesterday or something but like i submit to everyone um we are not to copy the saints we're to emulate them but we're not mm -hmm. to copy them right like if Cyprian sits out and says, I'm going to be, you know, exactly copy St. Cyprian of Antioch, right? God forbid. God forbid. And you're going to have problems. And God forbid on, for a lot of reasons, but primarily because, excuse me, what God wants and his intention is for you to be the you that he has intended for you to be, mm -hmm. which is only found in synergy with him. Mm -hmm. And and yes, the prayers of Saint Cyprian is you know to some degree him as being you know like a patron in the truest sense, yes. him being a patron for you to usher you into that life. But ultimately, if you try to copy 
him versus emulating him, you're shortchanging that process of, of what that intended of, of what it should be, right? Which is a unique, um, connected theosis, okay? a unique, connected, you know, human soul that is um, reveals the glory of God, and 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 the whole economy of salvation to some degree should be revealed in your life, right? That your yeah. life should reflect to some degree that little, it's it's the fractal, right? Mm -hmm. And it's important that if we lose that sense of the emulating versus the copying, I think this is where a lot of people go off the rails too with, let's say, hypercorrectness or rigid mm -hmm. or rigidity, where mm -hmm. they'd have the form but not the spirit, where they have, you know, the external but not the internal. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is this is very difficult because I think, for a lot of people with getting, you know, into this kind of pharisaical experience where the outside of the cup is all that matters. And I think that's the problem I have with this um, discussion about art in certain circles is in regards of orthodoxy and iconography in particular, right? As you start getting into, well, no, it's like it needs to be pure in this and this and that. And it's like, that's very dangerous because it, it removes the aspect of what it's there for, which is to facilitate communion. So hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And tonight we are joined by Father Boniface. And uh, normally we have Cyprian and Father Turbo here. And real quick, so we can get back into the conversation. I know I said I wasn't going to do an opener question, but let's just do one real quick. Father Boniface, I don't know if you know if you're familiar with our uh, format. But usually we start the episode with just a low ball just to kind of get the conversation going. Um, uh, well, I'm just but it's going, Andrew. It's going. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, what is art? There, there. That's the question. There you go. I had something else picked out, but I'm afraid it would derail things. So, yeah. Let's just keep it going. Well, well that might derail. That might derail it, Andrew. That I mean, you guys don't really have to answer that. You don't have to let's, answer that. Let's but, repeat yeah. the question that we had before. Yeah. So, yeah. so the question, the question is, I guess it's a two part question. So, the question is, is there any uh, I guess if we want to call it ethnic or national orthodox tradition that does not have its own iconographic tradition. That's the first question. And then is a prerequisite for a, what I guess if we want to call it a genuine, genuine or whatever American, but an American orthodoxy that is American is a prerequisite of that. An American, a genuinely American iconographic tradition. That's the question for both okay. fathers. So first, forgive me, I think it's very important that we don't presuppose the framework of either ethnic or national as the thing we're trying to move toward. Okay. The churches, I think, and Father, correct me if I'm wrong, the ch churches are regional, they're geographic. They are cities, and then collections of cities, irrespective of governmentalities and ethnic designations. And obviously, you are going to have clusters of certain kinds as things fall through history. But I think it's important to not let the conversation implicitly bring forward some kind of ethnic or national uh, preferentiality. So with that caveat being made, um, no, because I think, I, think the, I think the specificity will come out of the region, not precipitate the region. So in the same way, so, sorry, Father, please. No, I was gonna say, so I think, 
because it, it's the two part. And so the no is I can't think of what we would consider a tradition or, cons or consider, um, you know, a, a particular um, cultural expression, um, collective expression or church. I, I can't think of one that is um, valid that doesn't have its own expression. But, but also, can you think of one that only has one? No, I cannot. But I can also say this. I also, what I was going to say to the other part of the question, though, is because I'm I, I, I'm agreeing with you on the no, right? That because that, that initial initial no is like no. I mean, you think if you think of any church, it has its expression and sometimes multiple expressions, mm -hmm. right? Based upon region and time period, by the way, and time period, but. What I'm saying is, in regards to the question of, does it, uh, uh, how did you phrase it, Cyprian, precipitate? Is it a, is it a, is it a prerequisite? Would an, would an icon, an American iconographic tradition be a, be a prerequisite to a genuine American Orthodox church? So yes and no. I, I would, in, um, I, I'm going to say yes and no. Here's why. The problem is, is that the authentic, an American church, the American church, right, is going to produce that icon. It's not going to be, um, it's not going to be induced or um, brought forward by the icon. Does that make sense? Because people have in a very, um, forgive me, oftentimes contrived way, try to do this. I'm going to do an American style. And it comes out contrived and it comes out off. Why? Because it's idolatrous. It, it, it's, it's uplifting the individual kind of like identity ab above the point, which is the communion with the saint, communion with the, you see what I'm saying? So a, a true icon, the point is to, is to facilitate the, the communion with heaven. What, heaven in a broad sense, right? What is, okay, what is heaven? Well, look at an icon. What is an icon? Every icon is a human person and a halo to some degree, whether it's, right? And that's what heaven is. Heaven is persons united with God. That's what heaven is, right? The halo is the wedding ring and it is the symbol of that person being united with God, theosis. That's what an icon is. That's why it's a window to heaven. And that's what heaven is, right? Anything beyond that, right, is, you know, in a kind of or like a hierarchical order, spiritual hierarchy is like underneath that, right? Whatever you're kind of communicating, even the historical aspect of, let's say, whatever said um, event is being depicted ultimately is about that union. Right. So if you if that takes a back seat to putting forward some idolatrous approach uh, or some idolatrous emphasis on ethnicity, culture, even a time period, anything but that communion with God, I think that's where you start getting something is off. Right. That's why some of us have seen it. Some of us have not seen it. But there's some of these in particular Ukrainian icons that are off. Um, they're off because they're they're painted by these schismatics who are painting them with um, a, a nationalistic, ethnic, that that's its purpose, right? And so in some regards, it's like a political santeria, right? And the way that santeria seeks to adopt, you know, the saints and use them as avatars, as camouflaged avatars into, into you know, to, to facilitate all kinds of things, as we know, it, it's the same thing, but instead of on a kind of like lower level of personal gain, wealth, whatever that would happen in Santeria, power on a personal, on a smaller individual level, they're doing it on, on a larger scale of principalities, nations, right? 
in regards yeah. to yeah i was about to say forgive me father prince it's like print it's it's still principalities though still i mean the the voodoo the santeria they're still yep. using the saints to represent principalities in yep. that way i had yep. never thought about that yep. oh that's dangerous yep. yeah it's very dangerous and it's powerful and it's work and it works i mean that's where you get these you know legit neo-nazi movements in ukraine slob ukraine and all this stuff we've seen the videos you know and it's legit like facilitating that and it's powerful right it's it's powerful i mean we've seen it here in the states with the those you know uh george floyd oh. um murals that have employed a halo and tried to invoke a religious aspect right it's the same well, fauci thing. too father forgive me fauci, yeah, fauci. They, they did one with uh they've done them with biden they did them with a whole bunch of people it's yeah. very weird yeah so i mean because it works and because it's powerful right so so I think this is something to really watch out for because that person is like, we need an American church and we, we need to do this. And, um, you know, the way to do it is, you know, make an icon and then it'll be, um, you know. Uh, Can I offer an example? Please. So take, uh, take St. Sophronia of Essex. Right? Mm -hmm. He developed a new iconographic style, for, for lack of a better way to put it. But he did that because he was looking for something that uh, would use less pigment, among other things, and would work with the space and the lighting, etc. And so it's a very, very gentle, pure image, but he's doing it in prayer, right? He's not trying to create a new style. He's not trying to um, make a, a, a British orthodoxy. He's trying to be orthodox in Britain with the limited resources that he has living in the landscape that he's living with, with the resources that he has access to. And so he creates something which is absolutely gorgeous, is purely orthodox, and is markedly different than you see elsewhere. Uh, and you're now starting to see other iconographers either trained under him or influenced by him now. And so you'll start to see that kind of iconographic style showing up in temples elsewhere around Great Britain and presumably elsewhere. I wouldn't be surprised if it showed up somewhere in the U.S. as well. Um, this is a wonderful example, Father. Sorry, continue, please. And so you also have, and I don't know who who painted slash wrote uh, this one, but I've also seen an icon of Saint Peter the Aleut, which, on one hand, you look at it and think, okay, that's a lovely icon. But once you start thinking about it, it it is done in a style that. I think evokes First Nations embroidery techniques. The color contrast that's used, the kind of decorative motifs of the roundel, um, and uh, so you have this. And, and likewise, I think I've seen icons of um, Saint Matushka Olga, mm -hmm. who, likewise, there is something about the way that it's painted. It's clearly done in an, a way that's influenced by traditional Russian style of iconography, but you can tell that it wasn't done by a Russian iconographer. It was done by somebody who had seen a lot of Russian icons, but was trained artistically, as far as I can tell, in a um, you know Pacific Northwest Coast style of uh, visual design. And that's, I think, where we get it is by having Orthodox people who happen to be trained in the stylistic practices of whatever we call America, um, who take that prayer and put it into the vocabulary, into the kind of gestures that they know. And that's how we create the visual, oral, uh, liturgical practices that are American Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question, Father? Um, or father, either father, is this why um, anime icons are not like, because I've heard you talk a little bit about this father turbo about like how anime icons are not appropriate. It's like, um, it's not traditional Japanese. Like, you know, have you guys seen these where it's like, yeah, uh, yeah why that's not appropriate? Is this why we're talking about maybe why that's not appropriate? Not, I'm sorry, for what father was saying earlier about a culture like seeming to supersede the need to like, create a means of communicating or interacting with heaven. Is that, do I remind on that at all? Yeah. Like, 
if I'm picking up what you're saying, the problem with that is that, again, it, it's – you've seen people do this. I mean, they've even done it in regards of um, – you can tell. Um, when, and it's uh, – when people have done – Let's say, like, I want to make a nightclub that's going to um, speak to African-Americans, but it's contrived. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Father. Sorry, Father. Sorry, Father. It's, it's so, one of those things. Wow. I think it's a beautiful piece of illustration. I wouldn't recommend putting it in a temple. But if it's the thing that gets somebody who is used to looking at anime images and says, maybe there's something more. Well, here's the thing. Forgive me. I, w- I want to move with that a little bit because there's nuance. It's important. The explicit, like, I want to marry, <laughs> I, I want to, in a very contrived way, overlay that the anime style is one thing, but here's, here's to my point. Um, I've spoke about this before, where on a deep level, you know, as it's scandalous, whatever for people, anime has influenced me aesthetically. I mean, I grew up in the 70s watching Battle of the Planets, Transor Z, Macross. And, you know, on a very technical level, the, imp- the, the process of, you know, you know, a dark medium and light in regards of the rendering of color and shade. Well, that was a very, I mean, that moved me into, um, you know, getting into impressionism with, you know, with Monet, you know, and it was like, that sounds crazy people, but those could, it was connective tissue for me, if that makes sense. And so when I started, you have to understand that I've, I've talked about this before, like the quote unquote mystical religious art typically Historically, has has a a a, be, a grounding in what would be what we would call, you know, kind of quote unquote flat and two dimensional, right? Everything from Egyptian hieroglyphs to, um, you know, uh, illustrations out of the Vedas. There is this very illustrative, which what it does is it it brings you into this place of transcending the the natural fleshly gross not gross as an ew rotten food but the gross materiality that is that is necessary to move into like inner space right visiting iconography you know is a development guided by the holy spirit which which hits this perfect zenith by which it isn't disincarnate and gnostic but it, 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 it becomes problematic if it takes on too much of the gross materialist. So the sensualist paintings, right? It's why El Greco is about as, as good as you can come and get because you begin to start moving into that naturalist aesthetic, which pulls you out of the spiritual. That being said, that being said, anime really, for me, like technically it facilitated a lot of that. It, it, was, it was a schema that, was imp- that helped to kind of bridge and make I, make the ability to pray with the icon make sense to me just like that, right? So if you understand the technical approach and aspect of any art as a gateway and, and another layer of symbol, because symbol isn't just the meaning that is, you know, being communicated. It's also the means of the communication, <laughs> if that makes sense, right? So all of that is part of it. And so that was, and that was my context. And that's getting back to why if I try to exercise, if I try to excise that from myself in, um, in a vainglorious way, it will be problematic. But if I try to lean into it too much, it'll be problematic. On the one hand, it will, hollow out me as an individual and it will allow this is why you can see for me you can see some icons that are like technically executed perfectly i guess and like oh you can see it's like 
you know, very, you know, quote unquote, you know, you know, neo Byzantine or whatever, but it's hollow. Yeah. It's hollow There's because, no excuse me, father. There's no prayer in it. There's no prayer. There's no presence. There's no presence. And they, so they've excised to a degree. They've hollowed out themselves to such in, in the wrong way. It's not canonic in the sense of, of being emptying for love. It's canonic in the sense of vainglory of like, I want to have everyone know that I am I have mastered the Byzantine style. That is mm. not prayer. That's vainglory, even though it's technically executed well, right? And the other side of that is like, I'm going to make anime icons because I want to reach, you know, Zoomers and gamers. That's wrong too, because it's about reaching people versus connecting with God. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? So both of them will lead you into, into an error from my... There's a... There's a note at the beginning of this uh, homily on profitable subjects where it talks about the monk who's translating it is talking about the need to retain St. John's, like, for lack of a better word, like syntax. Mm. There's a need to, re- to like speak eloquently and translate properly as opposed to, he said there's two ways of translating, which is one, leave the reader alone and bring the writer to the reader. And then there's leaving the writer alone and bringing the reader to the writer. And he said he opted for the latter because he's like, there's a, there is nuance in what he's saying. And then he gives some examples of different scriptures being translated and how they're kind of missed the mark. It's like, you miss the mark by, you know, by, um, by translating this in a more palatable quote unquote, which is, I think just another word for simple, like bringing it to a place where it's like the person's like, well, I can understand this a little bit more. And then this is the last thing I'll say and I'll be quiet. But there was this, um, I just heard the story of a deacon who accidentally changed a word in a gospel reading. Uh, I think it was uh, picked up his um, bedding. It was during, about the paralytic, he picked up his bedding and he said bed. And um, the priest came up to him afterward and said, no, it's very important. You do not change this wording because you're missing the mark and i've realized that since reading the gospel reading every day if you change one like i actually messed up powers instead of power like in in saint paul's epistles i can't remember exactly where but he, he says the powers and, and i actually said power and i went back and i said no powers makes this sentence completely different mm-hmm. it makes it completely different and it's one little letter so yeah that's all i had to say so there's a there was a recently a and I'm I was trying to look just right now but there was I, I was talking with some friends and we were talking about and I can't even remember the verse but I, all I remember was it was how bad this person said oh yeah I've been reading oh I think it's this one called the message maybe it's the uh, message oh the message translation yeah and I was like this isn't even cl- this it lost it's it's like it lost everything mm-hmm. yeah all all of the all uh, basically god's god himself was stripped out of it mm-hmm. i was like there's not there's not even it's not even worth it's it's almost like the let's say that the 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 metaphor that that christ was using was like I, and I forget the verse. I wish I could remember the verse because the translation was so bad. It was so bad that you read it and, and then other people read it also. And they were like, oh, I, I wouldn't have even known that this was this verse. Like, yeah. it's that it's that yeah. bad. Yeah. And I think that that's what you're. Well, here's the other part of it, too, is that people can have good intentions in regards of I just want to reach the people. But again, that's. It's off because, you know, it's the cross that you need to have the vertical and the horizontal. If you complete a lot of people, they'll have just the horizontal, the people, the people, the people, and they cut out the divine, they cut out God, they cut out the saint. And that's where you get, um, this is why, you know, like the Lord, even in the use of parables and the the way that the Lord preached. and, And I mean, the whole of his ministry, there is this space in which, you can't cross over right that's that's necessary in the sense that there's invitation there that's part of the call of there is this this wooing and this playing 
this 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 back and forth that happens. And I think that when everything is laid out in such a way, there is no dialogue there there because you know what does he say um it, it's um you know i call you now friends you know there's there's something that happens with for instance mystery right mystery in the sense that mystery is there to invite into that's how i that's like that's how the ways i like to explain mystery to people it's it it invites you into something and that is an aspect of a relationship and if something is something is laid out too much um in in this context of dealing with the divine that's where you get these weird things like the message bible where it strips out god and it just presents something that you can you know handle as like this is great this is now my very clean moral um rule book that allows me to say well i'm i'm religious on my terms right and that's you know this this is one of the things again um it's not intentional but i think it is one of the reasons why um iconography byzantine iconography is so powerful is because all of the aspects of it the the forward perspective inverse perspective it, it's just yeah it's Can odd just that? enough you know it's like yeah. what's going on here so I think I think that's very relevant, and one of the one of the things that I think we need to remember when we think about how iconography and new forms of iconography work is to not lose basic principles of things like forward perspective. Make sure that there is the possibility of basically eye contact with the saint, so that there is that kind of intimacy in prayer. Because it's the thing that that happens in western christian religious art over the years is that it shifts from facing you to facing up and out and always bringing the attention away and so this is on one hand a very traditional russian style um, in the academic school but you can see that saint nicholas of mira has his head shifted down which i think is actually kind of problematic mm -hmm. Um, and on one hand, it's a beautiful rendition of uh, Star St. Nicholas, except that his feet are weirdly undeveloped, which is also odd. But it's the it's the downward tilt of St. Nicholas of Mira's face that I would think, mm, why is that? Why was that rendered that way? It mm -hmm. feels like somebody's trying to do something intellectual with the iconography mm -hmm. instead of something prayerful with the iconography. But you can also then have so this one is um, a piece by uh, Shane Swenson, who is a fairly prominent American iconographer right now. And I absolutely love his work. He works across multiple different styles. And I have yet to see one of his icons that I did not feel like was written with prayer. Um, and this one of Matushka Olga. I think it's interesting because on one hand, you have the clothing in a very... I think typical Greek style, but the way that the face is done, mm -hmm. I think is much more in a kind of academic style mm -hmm. in the Russian academic school. Mm -hmm. But the thing is you don't feel like those two styles are discordant. He somehow weds those two traditions in something that I think is truly beautiful and prayerful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also I'm not sure if he's, I'm not sure if he's doing this intentionally or what, but I think the way, that the uh, bowl of water that she's using. I don't know if you can see the lines. Yeah. I think that's also drawing on um, First Nations representations of, of water. Um, that's purely speculation on my part, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's... Yeah. Um, and so I think it's, it's that wedding of different possible techniques and then... In anthropological literature on art, there's a concept um, that comes from uh, Alfred Gell about the principle of least difference. So within a style, there is infinite possibility for new forms, but within a kind of boundaries. So what's the least amount of change that you can make 
to make something new, to make something distinct, but it's still clearly representing the same prototype. It's still clearly representing the same purpose and tension and description. And so you'll have, uh, so he's writing about the, the Polynesian and Melanesian islands, right? So you have one island that has a very distinct style and the next island have very distinct style. But if you compare those then to a third one, they're similar. And so as you get into larger circles of influence, that principle of least difference is a little bit larger. And so obviously traditional Byzantine style is going to look different than traditional Russian style. And But within each of those traditional large schools, you'll have local techniques that are ever so slightly different in terms of how you fold the fabric or how you mix the color or whatever it is, how you shape the eye, um, right? You have, you have some iconography from Jordan, for instance, with these really beautiful um, almond-shaped eyes, um, which is very distinct and unique mm -hmm. in its own way. Um, but I think as long as we have that, as long as we allow the option for creative interpretation and application of techniques, we're fine. But that has to follow and be swept along by the impetus of prayer. And if it's not prayer driving that, then it's going to end up in the ditch. Mm -hmm. But if the orientation is toward prayer, one should expect, as you say, those sort of small, the differences to happen, but they should manifest as relatively small, these, these iter almost iterative changes. For the most part, right. I think, but I think you can have, right, like icons of the Theodogos with three hands. And obviously that is mm -hmm. a radical departure from tradition, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but also it's firmly within tradition because it wasn't intentional, right? It, it was, it was a thing that happened that it, that came out through prayer. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so um, I think going back to what Father Turbo was saying, like we don't need to be overly restrictive on this. There is fidelity, right? You have to have fidelity to the tradition. And I think the other important thing is that you have to be trained in the tradition before you start doing the innovation. Yeah, you need to know the rules where you can try to bend them or break them or whatever you're going to do. It's absolutely necessary. And that's what happens to a lot of people is they don't want to put the time in and they just kind of approach it from outside the tradition as a spectator and you can see it, you can feel it, you know, even if it's executed like perfectly, you can, it's still there. And because it's a spiritual medium, mm. right. Prayer. Right. And, and, and I, I think one of the problems too, is that people oftentimes operate out of fear. And so they're so scared of getting it wrong or they're so scared of something not being legitimate that it actually kind of knocks them out of prayer at the same time too, if that makes sense. Right. And Father, forgive me. You're saying when they're that you're saying iconographers, when they're painting an icon, is that mm -hmm. what you're saying? Yeah. Mm. They're motivated by fear, fear of, you know, it, it's a different kind of vainglory. It, it feels like, no, I just want to be true to the tradition. I'm just trying to get away from me. I don't want me to come through, but on the surface, it seems like a good movement, right? But but if someone doesn't know themselves well enough, that fear can actually, fear is never good in that sense, right? Because it, it's not the fear of God. It's the fear of, it's vainglory. It's the fear of being perceived some way, being perceived as an imposter, being perceived as I don't love the tradition, all these things. Well, it's like that moves people into, it, this is again where a certain type of rigidity can often come from, from an iconographer. So what I'm trying to get at is, getting to that law that Father Boniface was talking about, the variance that can happen and, and that is inevitable to happen from authentic prayer and, ex and experience of, of painting an icon, that variance almost proves the rule to some degree. Because when you, when you introduce something that's like, oh, and you can tell that it, it wasn't contrived, that they weren't like, let me put my spin on this. But it's this bubbling up from within them and it takes it down this other road, the going down the other road almost highlights for you in a new way how it's connected to tradition 
if that makes sense what I'm saying. It it it, it highlights it and gives it enough contrast to be like, oh, I, it makes where it is actually rooted in tradition more explicit. Right. And, and, that's it, and it's why... defining what so forgive me, Father, and it's defining what the boundaries of tradition actually were. Correct. It's revealing it. It's reveal it's a revelation of, of what the boundaries actually were. Correct. For all... Because for instance, there was a phenomena where people were painting. This is um I remember when I first came into the church, um, because I came into the church, if some people remember or know, through 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 the icon specifically. Uh and when I first came into the church, even before becoming a catechum being received. Um, I remember some of these discussions happening in regards of, uh, which was a totally different thing, because hey, let me digress a little bit. A lot of people don't realize how much all of this has changed because of the internet. The, I mean, for for the better, I think mostly, but there was a time when like you could not get resources, you could not find anyone, you could not even see icons. like. You had to see them in books and get them in books. There wasn't there wasn't Google images to kind of go and pull up and all this stuff, right? But what I'm the reason I'm saying is there was these discussions about iconographers who were approaching the icon from a certain way and they were painting icons in a in a particularly dark, right? And the discussion around it was well, they thought that they were dark like this, but what it was, was once they, once restoration was becoming more and more prevalent, they're realizing, Oh, they didn't realize how, how brilliant and bright these icons actually were. Now on the one hand, it developed a very nice, you know, to be charitable kind of, you know, um, sober, you know, you could even almost say like a hesychastic, you know, um, aesthetic. Yes. But at the same time, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't uh, in line with the tradition in the sense that they were just seeking to copy something versus emulating it and allowing, right? And so that copying revealed a, a kind of error, if the, if you follow what I'm saying. So this is why it's important to understand that if you if you intentionally and in a wrong, vainglorious, self conscious way try to squish out any type of personal variance, that's not the tradition either because it has to be living. And it's almost, it's almost if in the same way, you need to just come to learn to accept yourself when you're received into the church, received into Christ. And you can only try to be super hyperdox, you know, perfect, hyper correct guy or super hyper, I'm going to renovate, you know, I'm the one that's going to save the church and bring it right and bring it up to that's current, like, whatever poll people but people find themselves like i mean we've all seen it or been it where we want to correct the church one way or the other and it's only until you kind of let that go and just be like well this is just who i am and you know i'm i'm I, god's got to work with it it's this it's the same thing i think you know um, can i pick up on that please so in and and bringing this back to the original question i think so being 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 oneself and and also and and letting god transform oneself into who we are um so your your question originally was about you know a, a not a, an orthodoxy in america that's like authentically american or whatever um i was once told I think a sage piece of wisdom by somebody who was frustrated by a conversation around authenticity and being authentic. And they said, the only people who are concerned about authenticity are ones who don't have it. Hmm. It's a fascinating question. So, and I think the, I think the, the American question is somewhat uh, caused by the fact that so much of the population is immigrant or the generations down, right, settler. And oftentimes that dislocation, I think, is actually quite disruptive 
Because to know who one is, uh, to quote Plato, whither and whence, my dear Phaedrus, where have you come from and where are you going? You need to know the journey that you're on, which means that you need to have some kind of connection with, and I think it has to be a tactile connection because we're physical beings. It has to be a tactile connection with the ancestors, basically, with the people who have gone before, so that when we're praying in church for the people who lie asleep here and everywhere in the world, our fathers and brethren have gone before us, that we can then walk out of that building and see the tombstones or see the ossuary or see the, you know, and actually physically walk there to do a memorial, to stick a candle in the earth. Because that gives you a rootedness that just isn't there for the vast majority of A, people in the North American continent and B, people living in some kind of state of modernity because it has been so disruptive, because there's been so much work to sever that connection between the individual and their forebearers. Um, And so that makes it very difficult for anybody to know who they are. So in some ways, I think orthodoxy in America needs to stop worrying so much about being American and just be orthodox. And after Mm -hmm. a few generations, by God's grace, there'll be a, an American orthodoxy. Yeah. yeah. And maybe it's, and maybe it, maybe actually that would be, because I think what a lot of people are struggling with, Father, I think that was just so excellent because it, 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 it just opened up to me like, what is it that people are struggling with? I hear people talking about, you know, they're bemoaning the, destruction of Western culture and the loss of American identity and all of this. But then the question is like, well, what was the American identity there? Like, was that just a, like a, a, a specter? If it, if it could just be removed so quickly that people can't grab it, like you say, there's, there's no tactile connection to it to where I can't just go to a place and then sort of just be like recharged with my American identity. It doesn't work for me to just go to Washington, D.C. on the mall and walk through the Smithsonian and go to the Jefferson Memorial and go to the Washington Monument. And then it's like, ah, I'm I'm renewed. My American my American identity is back. And yet there are places in the world where people can return to that are traditional ancient places of their people where as you say their forebears may be buried there where they can return and be renewed in that way and have their identity and and you and you hear about it happening for americans all the time where they go back to their homeland and they're like oh i actually am home i actually am home and so i wonder if 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 maybe the promise of orthodoxy in america isn't actually to give Americans a legitimate American identity in the first place that we've never had. (laughs) Just give us more monasteries and it'll work itself out in a few centuries. Yeah, I mean, I I think Richard Rohr, um, Richard Rohr, Richard, (laughs) Richard Rohr, um, Roland, um, he had a really great insight. He was having a conversation um, with uh, Jonathan Pajot about this in regards to kind of like American identity and stuff. And um, he brought up a good point about, you know, every place that orthodoxy is, you know, kind of expressed, quote unquote, authentically, there's there's an icon of the mother of God that's kind of birthed out of that, right? Um, and I think, and so he was like, you know, it's like, once we see the, you know, the mother of God of, you know, fill in the blank, then you're, you're working with something. I think there's something, I really think there's something to that. Um, Missouri might be on its way, <laughs> you know, to have a, a mother of God of, but you see this, um, for instance, speaking of connecting these two things, uh, the, um, the uh, Yurandisa of Arizona, um, it's, you know, the, the mother of God of, of Arizona that's in St. Anthony's Monastery, right? Um, you know, there's, there was, uh, I think it was, you know, uh, Ladika uh, Maxine 
commissioned. There was, um, I remember seeing this uh, Mother of God of Los Angeles um, icon. Maybe you guys could pull it up. It's, it's, it's you know, it's one of those things where you, you see these things. I'll pull it up. That, um, that I think there's something to it, but it kind of proves the point of like, it's, it's a desire to reach out and to connect with heaven. That, that's the key thing, you know, intercede for us, our lady, <laughs> you know what I mean? Intercede for Arizona in, intercede for Missouri intercede for Los Angeles in such a way that it, that's, that's that kind of connective tissue. Um, because that's that connective tissue is the icon. Right. It, it's mm-hmm. it's the, the the yearning for prayer, for communion, for intercession and the the energy to, exp, you know, to paint. Is it this one, create. Father? Yep. That's the one. OK, let me see if I. Yeah, oh, I'm not, say, I, yeah, I'm cutting out. Yeah, I remember when okay. it was I remember when it was first, first if, um, uh, put out, you know, image. Um, and even you can even pull up the one of the lady of the mother god of Arizona is another one, you know. Yeah, um, and I, I mean, it, I'm from LA, like I, I know all that, you know. I mean, right. I'm from Orange County, you know. Right. The other, the other thing about Los Angeles is that the full name of the city is La Ciudad de la Reina de Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. She, it is the city of the Queen of the Angels. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's, it is, it is in. It is a severance mm-hmm. to limit it just to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's it right down there. This one? This one? Yep. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, to me, there is the, like, there's your proof of what needs to happen, you know? Um, and I mean, that's tough because, again, it, it, be it's controversial. We also have this one, of course. Oh, that's right. Well, yes, yes, yes. La, Vir- La Virgen. <laughs> I mean, that's the biggest one in North America. I mean, you're going to see that. <laughs> that's the so, biggest one by far. Father, um, may I ask just the ignorant guy here, and I'm cool with that. What distinguishes this as being of Arizona other than it's saying Arizona? Is there well, it, says it, it says it on it. Well, <laughs> there's a couple there. things. There's, there's a couple things, though. Um, in particular, it, it's it, so it'll it's it'll take a particular like there's different styles of or um expressions poses of the mother god um the tender kiss um seeker of the lost right um uh you know joy of all who sorrow and you can have that um archetype right if you will and then there will be variants to it right but in this one here you know it's you know, it's it's her it's her um, her outer mantle, right? Um, we can begin to pick apart certain stylistic things that were were done to really distinguish. Um, so, if someone was to say, "I want an icon, the Mother of God of, of Arizona," you know, they would probably do their best to really. Um, the pose would have to be the positioning between Christ and Mother God would need to be the same. Um, the way the vestments are laying on each of them would need to be very similar, if not the same. The colors could have some variance, right? Because you could change the colors up to a certain degree, but have the thing, that, you know, but have the rest similar to still maintain the integrity. And this is getting to what Father, what we were talking about in regards of there will be you won't really know until someone starts reproducing it. And then someone goes like, nope, I made it all white. And someone's like, nope, that is too far out of the boundary. Right. And it could be for that particular icon to, to make Christ in all white vestments for some reason may be too far out of the boundary for this particular icon. Does this make sense what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it may not be for another one. So, so there is, cause here's a, here's another problem. People will get into these rigid systems and let's say, okay, eye interpretation. This means this, this, this all the time, and like that's just not true. Because for every hard fast rule, for the most part, that you say this is what it means, I'll find you something that says no. The the and then again, the exception proves the point, right? But you get mm-hmm. what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So um, that's 
that's a huge thing in regards of what has happened there. Um, and I don't know for sure. I don't know. Someone will clickety clack and correct me, but I imagine you're on the from being, you know, the holy man saint that he, that he is, was, was understood the need for that offering and that connective tissue to the intercession of the mother of God over his monastery, over the, over the, the region in which God had called him to plant the monastery. Right. So, um, it's intentional, but not contrived. If that, if that distinction makes sense, you know? Um, and I also think this is why some of the really, um, I don't want to say ignorant, but some of the wrong hardline approaches people will make are very problematic. For instance, I think that there is, um, for instance, forgive me, today we did an akathist to, you know, uh, we did an akathist to the mother of God today before uh, jumping on here. And that particular icon we were praying, we were, we were praying in front of, some people have made, you know, one person in particular made a comment, and, and it wasn't a negative comment. It was a positive one. I I, I saw it as a positive one of how it had, um, because the 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 clothing, the vestment that the Mother of God is, is in has stars, and it had a very um, uh, almost... Not it wasn't like Fatima, but it had that. Um, what is the one, Father? Um, we well, just pulled it, you just showed her. Um, Guadalupe, Guadalupe, Guadalupe. Here, 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 Guadalupe. It, yeah. yeah, it has an almost Guadalupe feel to Father, it. Can I, can I show a picture of the icon? Sure, sure. Yes, this one here. So that's the mother of God, the uh, terror that's... of humans. Oh, is that well, you got to show the bottom also, Father. So that people could see the bottom because she's st stepping on a demon. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. So beautiful. So. And it's hard to see. The other thing, the other thing that I love about this is in the halo. Uh, there we go. You can see. The seraphim. Yeah. yeah. Very subtly, but it's there. Yeah. And so there's even the crescent moon underneath the halo there. Um, and so there's those aspects that, that were mm, and, uh, not necessarily even intentional per se, but out of prayer, but intentional in the sense of it wasn't, there wasn't an intentional trying to connect to the Guadalupe. You know what I'm saying? But it's, but it's there. And I think what happens is if people strive so hard again, in a contrived way to try to just sever um, the, in a very kind of sterile way, that connection that is there to some degree being in the Americas, if you guys are following what I'm saying. Well, and Father, you're also from Southern California. Yes. I mean, that imagery is everywhere. Yes. Like we, we, we were soaked we in the in soup it. of Le Virgen. Yeah. She's everywhere, everywhere in Southern California. Everywhere. Everywhere. Grew up, grew up in it. And, you know, I mean, I I would be I would be wrong, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that. And instead of you know, I, I embrace that. I'm thankful for it. I'm, I'm thankful for it. You know, um, so I just think that's an aspect of this too. For instance, you know, just realizing, you know, being raised in that. Enlightenment, Protestant, rationalistic mind, it, like it is what it is. So, how's Christ baptizing it in my life? How's Christ baptizing it in Andrew's life, Cyprian's life, Father Boniface's life? Because we're all, we've all, it's it's the soup we came up from, right? And if and if we try to, you know, it's like the person who wants to come in and they they want to start diagnosing themselves spiritually and confessing themselves spiritually. It's like, it's, you know what I mean? It's like, no, no, no. It's like, you can't purify yourself. You just have to offer your life to God. 
And, and I think this is the thing in regards of when we see that these that there are these influences here, if we are authentically sub- submitting ourselves to God as best as we can and just praying, then what will happen is those things, they're there and they're going to be baptized. And that's what will be the ultimate result. And, and it will be, quote unquote, that, um, you know, regional style, whatever it will be. It won't be called American American style. It will be something more like, I don't know, it'll probably be something more akin to a, a, a city, like Father was saying, like, oh, here is this regional, here's this Midwest, this Midwestern style. Because you could see that. I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, Father, please forgive me, not you, but Father, um, dear Abbott, he's going to be so mad about putting him out there on the internet, but it is what it is. There is a monastery in New Mexico, which is probably one of the best monasteries in the country, for sure. And one of the things that's shocking about it is it is this perfect, quote unquote, authentic expression of orthodoxy in the Southwest. I, I walked in there years ago and was just blown away, blown away. Adobe buildings, right? Uh and from the trapeza, you know, there's the Byzantine uh, flag, you know, the double-headed eagle, the American flag, and and the New Mexico flag. And it was just like, yeah, that's awesome, right? In the church at the time, they took it out. Now there's wood floors. But these really large, very uncomfortable, like, large adobe tiles that were they're terrible to stand on. But it was so authentic, you know? And then, like, a serape on the analogians. So instead of having the kind of traditional quote unquote brocade or like whatever, you know, um, I don't know, Rococo, <laughs> like, like, like fabric, you had these, you had this, the sarape, this, you know, the kind of Mexican blanket over the analogian. It w- and it wasn't contrived. It was just beautiful, you know, um, it's things like that. No one, no one knows about it. No one, I mean, very few people may know about it now, but they were doing that because they're honoring the mother of God in the place where they're at. These, these humble monks where men become angels. You see what I'm saying? They weren't taking snapshots and going like, Hey, this is how you outreach to, to the indigenous people in New Mexico. That's not it. Right. It's like, this is our prayer. This is our prayer. And, and see, that's the type of discipline that it takes. You know, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. That's the type of discipline it takes to really say, I'm doing this for God and really mean it. And, and that means like no one may ever see this good, but God sees it. That's the type of discipline it takes for anything, right? Uh, in regards to the spiritual life, right? So that our offering is for God. That's a pure offering. If I'm doing something because I want to impress Cyprian, <laughs> That Cyprian's great, but Cyprian ain't God, right? Something, something's wrong. If I want to do something, you know, this is, this is part of the problem in regards of, I mean, I, I'm, I am just immersed in it all the time, right? Because this idea of how do you reach African-Americans, quote unquote, I just think you have to pray. <laughs> I think I just, I think I just need to pray and love whoever got, whoever comes across me and care enough to want to know about whoever is reaching out to me. So it's easy for me because it's just, it's, it's, you know, who and what I am. Right. But, you know, um, I'm not a woman. I got a lot of spiritual daughters, right. I, I feel comfortable saying, and I think my daughters would agree I care enough about them to try to understand what they're going through as women, right? Just, just simply so that I can like love them. So I can serve them. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm not like, oh, I want a bunch of like women. for No, no, no. It's just, okay. This is what God has for me. What is going on with you? I, I need to know like what makes you tick, right? Out of love, right? That's one of the secrets to missions. I believe, right? I believe because, you know, uh, why is it that you see, um, I think anytime you see orthodoxy 
penetrating into a particular community in our context it's let's say subculture what is it right it isn't just the superficial thing people might think it is because i got i got friends and spiritual children that like you know five six seven ten fifteen years in the church now so it obviously wasn't just a flashbang of this is kind of cool and novel right what is it it's really being like hey what makes you tick because God cares about, here he knows what makes us tick, but God cares about these things that make us up, the whole person. And I think this is a big part of the expression of iconography is that it is taking in totality the whole of the person. The iconographer is just present painting because that's what prayer does. Prayer causes you to be present. And if you're not present, the whole of you, then you have to ask what what's missing and why. What part of you is not present and why is it not present? You know what I mean? Because it, it it will be revealed. It will be revealed. So, so I I, I just want to I I want to I mean it's been it's been said, but I just want to like ex explicitly because I think this is the the I've understood. You know, prayerfully writing an icon but i think i'm understanding more now the the idea that the icon itself is a prayer is that right both of you fathers is that what you're mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. and and i i don't think that's limited just to an icon like everything that we do should be prayer if you are planting a garden that should be prayer if you are washing the dishes that should be prayer mm -hmm. um because and... forgive me, Father, forgive me, just want to interject. There's an art to it. You can develop an art to washing dishes. For, I know that sounds ridiculous to some people, but there's an art to it. Forgive me, I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, That's... no, definitely. And I think I think the other thing with that, picking up on what Father was saying about mission, is right, it is not our task to decide if our prayer, whether that's words or washing dishes, is noticed, is recognized by anybody other than God. Right? Look, look at people like St. Mary of Egypt or St. Onufrius the Great. The reason why we know about them is because God decided to send mm. somebody to them at the end of their mortal time in order to record their hagiography and bury them. And um, now I can't remember who it was that met Onufrios, right? He was so taken by it, he wanted to take over. He wanted to take over that hermitage that Onufrios was about to give up, that little cave and that palm tree, or date tree, sorry. Um, but Onufrios said no. And once he died, the palm tree died. Right? So, so that, that possibility of God decides if it's something that we're going to know about or if he's the one who remembers it alone mm -hmm. because we also commemorate the saints that we don't know so we know that there are saints we don't know we know that there are hermits that we don't know about we we're sure that some of them become glorified but we never know them because that is not in the mystery of god to reveal and likewise maybe i wash dishes and nobody finds out and but that right. and that is one of the biggest barriers for everyone and it's a particular barrier for those who are creative, quote unquote, artists. And it's a tough thing because the vainglory of wanting to be known, it's like it's the thing that has to be killed. It, but it's very, very, very difficult. You know, it, maybe rephrase that the, wanting to be known by man. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, I get it. You know, someone says, well, why bother? You know, but that's the thing is like exactly because the person who says, I'm still going to bother because God sees or, or because. I need this, right? I'm doing this because I need this. I remember he's probably the, uh, the this, this might be jumping the shark a bit, but everything being said about Bob Dylan and, you know, he sold us soul of the devil and all that stuff, you know, the chief commander and all that stuff. Okay. But I remember watching one interview with him. Uh, he's still alive, right? He's still alive. Yeah. Okay. He's still kicking. He is, yeah. Yeah. And I remember watching this interview. It was later on. 
Um, it was like a late, late interview. But I remember watching it. I was on a plane somewhere. But he said this thing, and it was just so impactful for me. And even though he probably meant it in the wrong way, and, and maybe he meant it in a kind of satanic way. I don't know. But he was like, I just got to a place where I got to do what I got to do. It doesn't matter what he even said. I think he said, doesn't matter what God thinks, doesn't matter what anyone thinks. I got to just do what I got to do. And the, the, way he, the way he said that, you know, it was really impactful for me because I, th- I think that's really important for people to understand as they try to actually enter into the spiritual life, which is this, <clears throat> look, if you're going to live a certain way that's contrary to what you're being told, by your spiritual father, by the church, whatever. Okay. You're free to do that. God's giving you the freedom to do that. But you better be ready to answer for it. And I and I I have actually there's one person, I had a person who um, you know, I was in a relationship with, I was guiding him, and you no, know, unfortunately, it is what it is, but uh there was a problem. You know, he was in this pattern, and I told him, I said, Hey, you know what? <clears throat> You're going to do what you're going to do. God's giving you that freedom. Who is it for me to, to try to even, I don't even want to force you to do anything. I'm not, it's not my place to take anything from you to make you do anything. But, you know, he, he was, you know, he was into, you know, kind of touching bases with women, you know, and I was like, you're hurting people as you're doing this, right? You, you better be in a place if you're going to make this next decision he's trying you know i said don't you know leave this person alone you're going to make this next decision you better be ready to be able to look you know face god and say yeah i i chose this you know what i'm saying because if you if you you're lying to yourself about you know there's these justifications you know religious justifications of all this stuff and it was all false i was like no just just be really honest about where you're at at least have the courage to say, nope, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm choosing, right? At least have the courage to do that. And I think that's really important because, you know, we all know that wonderful portion. In, and I, I think it's like Revelation 21 or 2 where it says, you know, the litany of those who don't enter into the kingdom of heaven, the adulterers, the sorcerers, right? But the cowardly, right? The cowardly do not enter in. There's something about that. There's something about when the person just doesn't, they 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 allow fear to dictate. So that statement from from Bob Dylan was really impactful for me because I was like, even if he's wrong and whatever, I, I get the arrogance, I get all that, but it's like I could respect that, you know. And I don't think that's going to change someone's judgment per se. But at the same time, there's that respect, you know. I, I don't know. I think there's something profound to it. And I think that's what a person who's praying needs to have. And iconography in particular is the, the painting of the icon is prayer, right? There's a courage that has to be there, you know? So a pure, a pure offering, forgive me, forgive me, Andrew, a pure offering is a, would necessarily mean whether it's dishes, whether it's writing an icon would necessarily mean the removal of self, right? That the that the idea was be, because what I'm hearing is this this I and and when I mean removal of self I guess more I'm talking about like a, a, a Freudian idea of ego right a Freudian ego idea that like I'm doing this and it's almost like I'm observing back on myself as someone external to be like oh how how do I appear to another mortal man. Who's who's or, looking or even at how me. do I appear to my understanding of God? That's oh, just interesting. glorious. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh, so even presupposing, even presupposing what I think God would or wouldn't. Oh, that's can you expand on that a little bit more, Father? Because that's really in, that's really interesting. Because I think I think most people would say, oh, but aren't I supposed to try to figure out what God wants? Well, I mean. On, on one level, I think God is fairly clear on what he wants. Um, the, the application of that is sometimes fuzzy, but oftentimes that's us in the own 
you know, I mean, if, if I hold my glasses up to my mouth, I go, and then go like that, um, right? That's my fault. Um, so, yes, if we have an understanding of God, um, by definition, that's a partial understanding, right? Because God is an infinite of course. being. Of course, of course, of course. We are a very finite, futile little project of the self. Um, and so if I stand there washing the dishes thinking, oh, God's going to be glad. Look, I'm doing something good. I am helping the house. Or if I am, you know, visiting my neighbor and I or I see the 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 beggar on the street, or if I know somebody who, you know, needs an encouragement and I go to them thinking, ah, God is going to be pleased. At the last judgment, he's going to put me over with the lambs, not with the goats. Well, then I've already lost. I've already lost the plot. It's transactional in that it's case. It's transactional. I've turned God into some kind of petty, yeah, statistician and uh, lost the plot. Uh -huh. But if I do it as an act of worship, if I say, great are you, God, and abundant in mercy, have mercy on me, this sinner, let's get my hands soapy and pray. With and I would, I would argue that's a, a big reason why that's so problematic for people is for this thing that we talk a lot about in regards of the almost exclusive rationalistic approach to God and, and needing to, I understand every little thing. And the person who looks at orthodoxy the theology as the gathering of information versus experience like that that is the fruit of that because someone may say well how do i get into that space then to where i'm not so you know um self-aware subconscious or you know contrived in my being how do i do that that's where worship comes into play and true worship can only happen through the through the matrix of wonder because Wonder, the person who can't, the person who doesn't have wonder is the person who I would argue can't really enter into prayer as they need to. They, they can't enter into prayer. They can't enter into that experience, that worship of God, because one of the ways that you begin to even fathom God, who is beyond your understanding and explanation, who's uncreated, is wonder. It's 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 a means by which our our finite, limited being, like Father was saying, begins to even it's the way that the ineffable is articulated to us right the ineffable which is beyond our understanding is articulated as wonder when you experience wonder that is the articulation the communication from the divine outside of us to us it's it's the condescension of the presence of god right to us right because remember what well who is god yes but just very quickly well what is god right well divine energies hypostasis right uh nature right divine nature like that's like god that's what god is who god is deeper and beyond right but there is that place where we can say well what is god Right. So when we talk about God, what we're talking about is divine energies. We're talking about hypostasis. Right. The persons. Right. We're talking about divine nature. Right. Um, aspects of the divine nature, omnipresence, omniscience. Right. Like that's what God is. God is a totality. As, right. But once that's about as far as we can go. And that's why the apophatic is important, because the person. Right is the ultimate thing right that is only encountered in wonder so that's why so many people that's what flipping back now where some of the polemic of the west versus eastern understanding is valid and i'm just speaking from experience of, of having spiritual children who are needing help to really move out of that space of that kind of zoological categorization of things 
and seeing that as the means primary to have experience God. And you can't. You hit a wall. You hit a wall. It is only when you begin to peel those things away and enter into the personal that you begin to actually get into that deep place of the heart and the experience. And that is primarily experienced initially, initially, because past that is silence. But initially, it's articulated to us, not by us, to us, if you understand what I'm saying, as wonder. Because, Father, forgive me, because wonder is wonder is signaling that we are encountering something that is objectively greater than we can, than we have the capacity to, to understand, to comprehend, to intellectualize, mm-hmm. even maybe even to feel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's like the Missourian, like me, going to New York for the first time. And seeing the buildings and everything and just being like, oh my gosh, like wow, I had no idea like civilization could be like this. Or, you know, I don't know, any other there's lots of jokes in there that you can make about the simple Missouri man that I am, but I'll take the simple Missouri man that I am. Um, I don't want to derail anything. Um, Father, is there a strong case that Art Deco could be uh like a um American icon, like stylistically. Oh, man. You truly bear the Holy Spirit, Andrew. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I just think I'm a fan of Art Deco, personally. And I, so I, I'm advocating for that. Who so. isn't? Who isn't, it's just, really? It's just all night I've just been fighting it. All night I've been fighting it. All night I've just been, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to, I'm going to resist it. I'm going to fight it. I'm not going to talk about it. So... Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's absolutely. where my mind went straight to. Missouri. Okay, absolutely. I'm just, I'm just gonna say it. You know, it's, it's something that if yeah, we're just talking, whatever. We're just a couple guys on the fireplace. I think if we were to take a uh, quote unquote style of art. And if we were to say, like, okay, all those things being said, the nuance, the inability to articulate, the ineffable, the apophatic, all that stuff. Okay, great. Everything we're talking about, great. Let's get down to some kind of, like, I don't know, just technical things, right? I don't, I can't think of a, I, I can't think of a quote-unquote, um, in regards of academically speaking, style of art that's more perfect in that sense. Uh because it, it is, there's in particular, and I, I've, there was a time when I, when I was even uh, playing around with, you know, I was like, oh, there's a, there's a, an artist, her name's Tamara de Lempica. You might want to, I don't know if you want to pull it up. I just, I don't want people to see it. <laughs> but there's this artist, Tamara de Lempica, who is just, oh, just incredible. And I was like, that is where you can start actually you could see, I you could see where iconography could go father you are so californian <laughs> you are so californian <laughs> you are so californian father like this is like yeah you could see where iconography could go if you go to that portrait the romana um, there's Which, other ones of uh, just one? like she's done. I mean, you could just see where it could go. Um, and it, I mean, that one right there, the portrait of a man right there. It's just like it's incredible. It's incredible, and and you could see where the yeah the movements and the and the things that people technically pick up on that communicate otherworldliness that communicate mm-hmm. all these that one down there's another one the one underneath him if you go down the, the doctor's lap oh door, yeah wow that's incredible. man i mean and so there was a time when i was i was fighting really hard because i was like man the temple here in kansas city should be done in this style because kansas city is like a a, a Mm-hmm. A, a capital some regard of Art Deco. It's everywhere mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. And we even have Art Deco aspects here in the temple. But but I just went with touches. I just went with touches of it here and there. But it is, 
if it was like if someone was like okay your life is whatever here you go i would do a temple or i would do a series of icons in that style because i think it is i think it is an, it, i think it is <laughs> i think i think that's what it is <laughs> i guess that's the best way to put it you know well, I mean, it's distinctly it's distinctly American, and it does speak to a very, very specific time. And I think a because a, I think even young, I mean, Andrew, you're 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 very young, but I think even you show this to an American teenager, and I think that they 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 have enough cultural references to it to understand that this is. I mean, yes, it. I mean, it did show up in other places too, but especially if they visited any like landmarks in urban in cities like stuff from the 20s 30s 40s like it's everywhere Everywhere. it's modern see what it does is it it takes aspects of modern understanding art expression there's cubist aspects of it without Mm -hmm. getting into the into the complete deconstruction aspect of cubism and modern art it does it just enough to speak to our psyche to speak to mm-hmm. our cultural psyche, it makes it makes sense. The use mm-hmm. of, of the use of light, it makes sense. Uh, mm-hmm. And and the way you do it is like if you can imagine it, you you take out the if you if you then were to use you know the the kiton and the himation like the the traditional clothing that we see icons in to anchor the icon in its history. But it's done in that style. You begin to now develop a mode of communication that, if it began and it was started to move forward, it would it would really, um, I think, resonate with people in ways that um, you, we, everything we've been trying to talk about. I think you would, I think you would see it. You know, um, well, it is. It's transcendental just by it's by its nature right like that that style Mm -hmm. and 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 maybe it's i mean is it is it is it influenced by iconography because i mean even looking at her work it's like so here's the thing here's the thing here's the thing so art nouveau predates it art nouveau heavily influences it but if you Mm want to break down the styles and the ethos the spirit behind each style Art Nouveau was, was, there was this um, strong movement in the understanding and the trying to observe the, the movements of nature. You see it in, mm. in the patterns that are used. But you're at the kind of dawn of um, mechanization. You're at the dawn of this ability, right? And then Art Deco is full on, you know, into this industrial age yeah. mechanization, right? Yeah. But you you take um, Alphonse Mucha, who's the master of Art Nouveau, and if you want to pull up some of Arf- Alphonse Mucha's, yep. you know yep. he's done. I mean, one of my favorite paintings. It's him. It's a painting he's done of, a, of an Orthodox church. It's incredible. It's the saints. It, it's a church, and it's you know you're looking at you know the icons, but the saints are coming out of the icon, right? And mm-hmm. Alphonse Mucha. Uh, is this great, you know, um, matrix because Alphonse Mucha being a slob, see that one right down there? Um, you can already you, see there's explicit Byzantine, uh, the, the one that says, uh, go up, forgive me, up. This one? No. This one? Uh, no, the one next to that, to the left, down. This one. Yeah. That one. Yeah. The, the use of the decorative, the halo is there, it's explicit. And it's intentional yeah. because he's a, he was a, he was uh, I think he was Czech, but he's a Slav. I mean, he, he's Orthodox, right? And then mm-hmm. I know someone's going to clickety clack, and I I know that he was he moved into humanism. I know that he was a Mason. I know I know all that, right? But like I'll I'll have certain arguments about things, but it was there. So if you pull up the one, I don't know if you can. I'm trying to think what it's called. Um, just type in Alphonse Mucha, like icon, or maybe like church. Um, it's stunning. Um, and it's this, it's the saints, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'll be able to find it. Um, anyways, um, 
Art Deco is a direct connection from that. And there is explicit business. All this, all the ornamental decorate, all the decorative work, that's all in, it's all influenced mm. by Byzantine art. <laughs> you know? There's a, there's mm. a strong Byzantine quote unquote orthodox uh influence uh, that is that is in that. And and it's it bleeds directly into uh Art Deco, you know. Um I am I found it right here. I'm going to send it to you right now. Okay. You can put oh, up. Well, I don't I don't have my I don't have my phone on me. Give me a uh I don't even I know. I won't be able to pull it up. Oh, you won't? <laughs> no. I left okay. my phone inside. Yeah. Well, um, maybe you can like, get in the show notes or something. Yeah. We'll yeah. Show notes. Yeah. Um, anyways, it the art art deco definitely is a movement. I mean, I even when you start looking at in regards to the architecture, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, um, across the board. So, yeah. God bless you, Andrew. Hey, I'm just a fan of uh, Bruce Tim and you know the Batman animated yeah. series from the '90s. I mean, oh all of them just right yeah, yeah. yeah. I Tim guess I, I've Dini. never, I've never really thought of that as Art Deco, but I guess it definitely is. Oh yeah, oh it? yeah, oh yeah, yeah, definitely there's, is. There's a comic book series called Starman, and it's one of the like. Um, you know, if you asked me, and no one will ever ask me, but if someone asked me 10 comic book series you got to read before you die, Starman by James Robinson. And in the beginning, um, Tony, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Of course, I can't remember. Tony Robinson, maybe. I can't remember. I don't, I'm not a big fan of his art style. He does photorealism, and I'm just not into it. A lot of his expressions and stuff are all messed up. But one of the things that got me to start seeing Art Deco in Kansas City was his that Starman series. And it's just the prominent use of Art Deco architecture in the creation of Opal City, which is the city that mm. Starman is supposed to be. Tony Harrison, sorry. Um, Tony Harrison, uh, the presentation of Art Deco and that was like, that's when I started to notice in the Kansas City skyline, there's these four pillars that rise up there in every, and when you drive by them at 4.30 in the morning when I was working my old job, like that looks familiar. It's Art Deco. And then eventually I was able to put a name to it. And then a couple of years later, Kansas City Museum had an Art Deco exhibit, which is absolutely fantastic. It was really, really great. So type in mm-hmm. Slav Epic. Forgive me, I found it. Type okay. in Slav Epic Alphonse Mucha and it'll pull up. And it's just, okay. it's, it's stunning. It's stunning. Okay, let's see. Oh, I see. I think I. Hopefully, this is it. But it's definitely cool. But well, it's let's one of those see. things where it's like you know, if, if we last for another five thousand years, is it will be the this style in churches? So it's like an, down. like an angel. No, no, no. Oh, scroll, it's, down, scroll down. Scroll down. There's the church. No, no, no. It's not that one. Scroll down. Uh, that one down there. See right there. I yeah, just goes. saw this. Number number eighteen. No. No, no, no! It's the one oh, above it. Back. That one. That one. Oh, I just oh, saw this. Yeah. Okay, let me open this in a new one. That is. I had the, I saved that to my phone because I just saw that and I was like, "This is incredible." Ooh, that's creepy. Wow. Wonderful. Yes. Look this at that. Is... Mm-hmm. Wonderful. You see that? Yeah. Oh my gosh! Do you oh, see wow. the so you see the icons in the background, but see the saints are coming. I mean, it's like man. Ooh. I mean, I, intellectually, I like the idea of what he's doing, but I, um, this would not resonate with me. I think, to put it politely, I don't know. Really, what, Res, hold on. Resonate with me. what in a church? Just, I mean, as a as a so. Uh, I mean, I, I, maybe this is one of those things where I, I'm Californian when it comes to Our, our Lady of Guadalupe and <laughs> Queen of the Angels. Look, there's St. Onufri am, right there, by the way. I am not in for the, um, this and the, the, the Art Nouveau artists that you were showing with the, the swoopy dresses and things. I'm okay with some Art Deco, but maybe I'm not the target audience for 
for this work. I'll I'll hold my my uh well my be, actual assessment until I see the sketches to, of these icons you're thinking well, of. Well well to clarify to clarify we were in the fray of something. What I was trying to get at is Art Deco, the connection to it is right. through Art Nouveau. In Art Nouveau, there was an there was because Alphonse Mucha is the 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 godfather of of Art Nouveau. What I'm trying to show here is the explicit because okay, I showed that the halo from that one, right? And so mm -hmm. like, okay, whatever, maybe, right? But yeah. then if someone's if someone's doubting the explicit connection, right. I bring this up to them. I'm like, no, 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 it, it's it's absolutely intentional. It's absolutely yeah. there. But this is not what I'm saying is the thing. I'm saying Art Deco is the, uh, in particular, some of the things that we saw from Tamar Del I mean, she's been the the inspiration in regards to, like, I've been working on that for a long time, like playing around with it. And it's it works. But this right here that we're looking at, this is what I'm saying in regards of, like, making Art, art Nouveau being that, seedbed by which art deco is kind of birthed that and and those connections um they're there they're there and that Muka, yeah that muka had the connection yep yep that 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 he had the or he that he clearly is influenced by orthodoxy there's no yeah, I mean, <laughs> no was, no, it, it no one orthodox, who isn't is influenced by orthodoxy would would like only an orthodox person could make this <laughs> could, yeah. could make this piece of art yeah so, or at least someone who had come up within the orthodox milieu. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I like this is, again, I'm not super versed in art and I don't have the language for it. But I love how chaotic all it's the- It's very chaotic. Like the um, parishioners are. It's just indicative of orthodoxy for me. It's not clean. It's not neat. They're just, everyone's doing prostrations and matanyas and they're all kind of on top of each other. and. That's just for me, that's very indicative of my experience of being orthodox. It's like, it's not clean. It's not neat. All, all it's really missing is like a kid, like, I don't know, like freaking out or something like that. Like just like screaming in the background or something. So, that's probably in there, Andrew. That's probably in there. Yeah, probably if you look far enough, you'll probably be able to see it. But no, I, I don't know what it is. Normally, I think something like this would scandalize me. But I saw it, I don't remember where I saw it the other day, not but like two days ago. I saw this for the first time and I was like, I love that. I saved it to my phone because I was like, I think this is absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, I mean, even from a technical standpoint, I mean, it's brilliant. You got, you got the realism, the hyper realism, and the Byzantine, like all yeah. put together in one. In yeah, one. it's a techni technically actually quite intense. It's, it's, yeah, it's brilliant. What's happening here is, yeah. But not, but it's not, you know, I mean, and, and if I'm not mistaken, it's huge. The mm. Slav Epic, it's a series. It looks, it looks like it's huge. They're it looks huge. like a big style. Huge. Um, mm, but, it, but again, you know, like, I don't know, maybe one day. Very interesting. Maybe one day when I'm not, you know, doing what I'm doing. <laughs> but that art deco thing, I mean, that's been a, a dream of mine to really kind of produce something. Because I'm a... I don't know. It's just it's it's been well. Maybe it's for someone else to do now. Maybe my time. Is done. <laughs> it's not, maybe my time is done. Well, if it's um, gonna happen, it'll happen. Coming up on two hours. As well. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I, yeah, I, don't, I won't say too much. Yeah, well, it's two. It is two hours, Andrew. It is. It's at two hours. Um, I um don't know how to end this. Other than th this is great. I mean, like I, I don't, I don't really have too much to say. I could say, <laughs> but it would cheapen what you guys have said. So, I mean, I just think that I remember my, I actually decided to move to Kansas city in the middle of an art museum. It was actually in our uh, mm. Kansas city, the Nelson Atkins. Um, mm. I was in there and we had just had this God does what he does. But I just had, it was when I was still in my addiction and um, we just had this crazy awesome night. I invived several substances. It was just, we went down to the Italian district, Kansas City, went to this super awesome bar, had this great night. I was driving back and like in the taxi, which is just a whole different experience for me as well. 
just like because i mean i was from i mean i'm from missouri originally but i spent the previous decade in iowa and it's just, it's just mm. like there's nothing really there and no so taxis um, in iowa driving in the back of a taxi all kind of hung over but still seeing some tracers and stuff like that for those who have ears to hear you know kind of what what happened and um we were walking through the nelson and i remember for like the first time like this visceral experience of like feeling this connection to like humanity, like that, like was just mm. not there in Iowa because Kansas city has history. There's things here and then being surrounded by this ancient, you know, thousands of year old stuff, you know, it was like, that was a very visceral experience for, for the first time I actually started to understand art a little bit more. And I, I think like that alone will always give me and then like later on scales kind of fell up my eyes a little bit i was able to in, in, ingest the visual medium of art a little bit more except until then i've been primarily audio and being able to like actually play around with like what art is and everything and like how it works and everything it was just you know so i hope that it cheap in the previous conversation that we just had but it, it was a very visceral experience it was very visceral so it was i'll remember it for the rest of my life so but gentlemen Thank you for coming in uh, to my podcast. It was incredible. Um, we have a way of contacting us at contact at royalpath.network. That is where you can uh, chat with our assistant, who is great at getting back to people in a timely manner, unlike me, which is Andrew at royalpath.network, which several people are still reaching out to me. Please do. But just remember, I'm very bad at getting back to people. It just takes a little bit longer. Um, we generally, when we mention a, um, musical artist, it goes up on a podcast on a playlist on Spotify. It's like Royal path podcast playlist or something like that. Um, we have a merch store, royalpath.store, and that merch goes straight to either the parish or the people who make the, uh, merch. No, we don't see any of it. Um, and then also thank you, Jack. Oh my gosh. Man, Jack. Man, the thumbnail from last week was incredible. Yeah, oh my gosh, I loved it. Mm -hmm. It was great. Anyway, I Thank saw you, that Jack. come up on my feed on YouTube or whatever, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is wonderful. So, Jack, thank you. Man, so Jack. Much. Mm -hmm. That was good. Mm -hmm. That was good. Otherwise, Father Boniface, thank you so very much for coming on. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Father. Having you. Thank you, Father. Um, hopefully again, you know, in the near future. That would be great. I uh, I really liked your insight. I think it was great. Um, it was a welcome. I won't say breath of fresh air because that would in, like indicate that it's stale in here, which I don't think it is. <laughs> but, um, but it was nice having a different perspective on here as well. So thank you, everyone, for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.